This is uh, the last session of an amazing uh, conference built on a concept uh, uh, that is uh, trying to bring together all the stakeholders, uh, the projects, the people uh, that can um, that have produced, but also who are co-designing, co-creating innovative strategies and effective principles in order to accelerate the emergence of dynamic leadership for successful implementation of the SDGs. This is what I said before. And uh, the idea of this conference was to gather the wisdom of intergovernmental organization, nation states, business, scientific research, educational institutions, civil society, youth organizations, all these stakeholders in order to understand what kind of principle, what will be the driving force in building effective leadership that can serve as a catalyst for, tra uh, for rapid transformation. We need the rapid transformation. We are under an existential threats. It's not just the COVID, it's climate change, it's inequality, it's uh, poverty, it's immigration, many uh, um, uh, issues to be dealt with. And it is um, really incredible to have a panel of uh, people who have actively uh, contributed to shaping this world, shaping the good aspects of this world in many different areas. Uh, academia, activists, policies, um, international um, uh, and uh, financial institutions. I think we have a lot to learn uh, from this final session, a lot to gain by bringing all the uh, uh, great messages uh, from the previous uh, days of this conference and uh, create a message that will lead us to the UNOG October 22 conference that will be followed by a report to the UN educational and other outreach uh, strategies in order to identify how to accelerate the implementation of the SDG and put human security uh, in the center of our uh, sustainable development. Um, this session was going to be co-moderated by uh, the Chief uh, of the United Nations Human Security Unit, Mernance Mostafani. Unfortunately, she is not able to attend uh, another amazing woman with so much to show in terms of contributing to humanity. But I'm going to read her introductory, introductory letter because I can never say it as uh, beautifully as she does. So she says, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome everyone to the final session of the e-conference on strategies for transformative global leadership. I have the honor of co-moderating today's sessions, a session with my esteemed colleague, Jonathan Grampo and Fili Kunduri. I would also like to take this opportunity to extend my, extend my appreciation to the World Academy of Art and Science, and in particular to Gary Jacobs and the team at the World Academy and the UN Office at Geneva for incorporating human security into this week's collective exploration of innovative strategies to accelerate the emergence of dynamic leadership. Culminating a week that has exemplified by rich and engaging discussions on a broad range of issues from COVID-19 to ecology, climate change, the economy, employment, education, and inequality, we are tremendously fortunate to have 
an extraordinary group of speakers for this session. They bring diverse institutional perspective, deep knowledge and extensive experience to help us consider how human security can provide humanity with a unifying lens to place people, their survival, livelihood and dignity at the heart of our actions and to help restore trust in our systems of governance for multilateral organizations to state institutions and the private sector. Before I give the floor to my co-moderator, allow me to introduce Mr. Jonathan Granhoff. I was the co-moderator, but first we will embrace the wisdom of Jonathan, who will provide the opening re uh, remarks to this session. Jonathan is the president of the Global Security Institute, a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science, and a 2014 nominee for the Nobel Peace Prize. Jonathan was also one of the first people in the US to advocate publicly for the need to advance human security in the early days of COVID-19. He's a passionate advocate for human-centered global system and we are delight, delighted to have him with us. And I am truly delighted and honored to have met him. Although recently I am captured by our discussions. Jonathan, the floor is yours. Oh, well, Phoebe, thank you very much. This is a, uh, an extraordinary group of people to be part of, and I'm honored to be part of this. Um, and why is this an extraordinary group of people? This is an extraordinary group of people who will immediately resonate to the title of what I want to put forward. It is, it is compressed in the following maxim that I think captures, captures the change that I think we need to have. Love people, use things. Never love things and use people. So things would include in the framework that I'll be discussing, de jure institutions, institutions of law that human beings create in order to fulfill their needs, which include their values as human beings and the very wherewithal through which we, we survive in our bodies and communities. Nations are things, corporations are things. So presently, the global order in the pursuit of security both economic security and the security of states, I would say is based on several myths. One of the myths is the security of the state is mainly pursued through military means. If you look at the budgets of the major states, that's where the money is. And money is an expression of real values of institutions. Presently, the world is spending approximately $60,000 a second on military expenditures. The budget last year was about $1.9 trillion of military expenditures, about 700 uh, billion from my country alone, over 700 billion from my country alone. This is based on the I, two, two premises. One is called strategic stability. Strategic stability is an abstraction. There's no place where you can measure it and uh, it has had various definitions, but the most accepted definition basically boils down to the capacity to inflict uh, unacceptable suffering on your adversary should they commence uh, use of force against you. In the nuclear world, it's called mutually assured destruction. But we now know how absurd this is because we now know that if less than 1% of the world's over 13,000 nuclear weapons were to be exploded, it would throw over 5 million tons of soot into the stratosphere and end everybody, everywhere's capacity to live in a civilized fashion. So we've moved from mad to sad. The, also, the irony of this, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of this system is that the more we perfect the weaponry, the less of our purpose security we obtain. As we integrate these weapons with artificial intelligence and quantum computing, 
and lower the threshold of time to, uh, to rectify mistakes of computers and human error, the hazard increases. So the more the technology becomes perfected, the less security we obtain. It's the wrong bus. The other, the other myth of, military, of, of the pursuit of security through military means is the pursuit of military advantage, which is also quite contradictory to, uh, uh, to strategic stability. So the military advantage did not prevail in Vietnam. It did not prevail for the Soviet Union and Afghanistan or the United States. And moreover, military advantage becomes a theft. Uh, the pursuit of military advantage becomes a theft from those who hunger and those in need. It's not just a theft of money, it's a theft of values and a theft of intelligence. The current posture of the major states, the nine states with nuclear weapons included, is modernizing and expanding the likely use of nuclear weapons. Nothing could be, nothing could be a better example of what Wangari Maathai used to call the wrong bus. The other uh, the other major institutions that we live with are the de jure institutions of international corporations, multi, multinational corporations. And the corporations, uh, as, as you all know, have a mandate uh, to operate bereft of human conscience. They, their mandate is to fulfill their charters as defined by the states that create them. And those mandates presently are based on the premise of infinite growth. But infinite growth is not the way in which the regenerative processes of, uh, of, of the planet operate. Regenerative growth is, uh, is, is based on the premise of, uh, of, of, of wholeness, of harmony, of the cycle of life. Whereas the major corporation is, is a linear process that is based on continual expansion. We've now reached the limits of what that expansion can do. I was in Greenland two summers ago, and I was completely shocked by what I saw. I didn't really, I couldn't really grasp the scope of the destruction. I thought if a hundred years ago, humanity had decided that we would come together and organize ourselves to melt the polar ice cap, people would have said that's technologically impossible. It's too great a, it's too, it's too great a challenge where I saw billions of gallons of fresh water that had been, that had been in, in, in ice for untold millennium melting. I saw huge areas where, uh, where the, 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 uh, the ice cap had melted and you saw these, these stone fields of, of beautiful different stones. They were all unique. It was, it was extraordinary. I saw where there had been, where, where a mere decades ago it had been three miles high and it was only it was only like a hundred yards high and big hunks of like the size of, of, of office buildings breaking off into the, into these, into these powerful streams. And why, why, why are we doing this? We're, we're doing this in order to pursue economic stability and security to provide goods and services for human beings, but we're doing it based on a myth. So I propose that we should be refocusing on the kind of principles that we see in the UN Charter, which is to, which is it, it gain, we gain, the UN gains its authority from the peoples of, of the nations, from people, not from states, it's actually the peoples. And it is focused, if you look carefully at the Charter and certainly the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, you see it all centers on the inherent dignity of the person. That's the purpose, that's the purpose of these institu institutions. So I think we need to have a very, very uh, large conversation of all the best minds on the planet to change from loving these things that we have created and using people to loving people and using these things because we create them. Um, last but not least, uh, I want to just address uh, the, the uh, the hurdle of overcoming the institutionalization of a myth, which is the myth of sovereignty uh, only being the state. So the state is a created, you know, the modern state was created in Westphalia in 1648 to stop the 
carnage of people who were arguing as to whose definition of Jesus' love was preferred. And, uh, and people like ourselves, thoughtful people, sat back and said, how can we stop this? This is, they're going to just, they're not afraid of dying. And they will continue to, they will continue based on their understanding, their myths, as it were, uh, uh, they will continue this carnage. So ideas were extremely important in the, in the years before this dramatic change in social organization in 1648. So the state was created by people like us in order to address a crisis in values and in the institutional expression of meeting human needs. We create a local governance to deal with our neighborhoods. We create larger bodies of states to deal with issues that are, are needed at the level of a state or a county. We create nations in order to deal with issues at that level. But we never expected in 1648 that science, technology, and human reach would have such an impact on the biological regenerative processes of the planet Earth. And that we would be able to destroy species at a thousand times the evolutionary base rate. That we would be able to destroy our third lung, the phytoplankton of the oceans. That we'd be able to destroy the water table and the topsoil. That we would have pandemic diseases that could travel so quickly without passports anywhere in the world. They never contemplated that when they created the concept that sovereignty is unbounded by, this, by the nation state. Today, in order to express the values and needs of people, we have to have global governance on these issues because uh, the notion of sovereignty is a human creation it's, it, and when it becomes treated as a reality, it becomes of mythical proportions. And we need to have a, what I call progressive realism. We can measure the health of the oceans. We can measure the health of the phyto phytoplankton. We know the science and technology of addressing these things. We know that if we had more effective global governance, we'd be able to deal with pandemics more effectively. So this is not a derogation of sovereignty to have global cooperation to deal with meeting human security needs. It's the very fulfillment of the basis of sovereignty itself because sovereignty begins with the people and institutions begin with the people. So we need to refocus the, the, the purpose of, these, of our institutions from uh, their self-serving self uh, needs uh, to meeting basic human, uh, human, human needs and bring some realism. And last but not least, uh, in human security, if we're talking about humans, people will argue, well, that's a little bit anthrocentric because we're just part of the web of life. But I would say that part of what makes us human is the fact that we are value-driven creatures. We need meaning in our lives. We live for love. Love means something. We, li we, live, for, we live for compassion. It brings fulfillment to our lives. The golden rule is not, uh, is not east, west, north, or south. It is a universal principle embedded in the human conscience and human beings have this capacity of conscience. We have this capacity. And our institution should be in accord with expressing the capacities that make us uniquely human, not just to feed and clothe us so that we can eat, sleep, defecate, and die, but that we can have meaning in our lives. And that meaning comes from the qualities of love and kindness and compassion. Now, of course, we have other qualities and other things, and that's why we have laws. That's why we have institutions to direct ourselves toward flourishing. Last but not least, I want to quote from someone who would, no one would call unrealistic, although when he first was proposing his theories of how the natural world worked, people called him completely crazy. And, and uh, what he was describing was not perceived by the senses. And yet the modern world rests heavily on his scientific insights. Albert Einstein said, do you know that yours is not the first generation to yearn for a life full of beauty and freedom? Do you know that all your ancestors have felt the same as you do and fell victim to trouble and hatred? Do you know also that your fervent wishes can only find fulfillment if you succeed 
in attaining a love and understanding of people and animals and plants and stars so that every joy becomes your joy and every pain becomes your pain. That call for a sense of expanded heart and compassion is what Jane Goodall calls the challenge with the modern world to move from the head to the heart. It's the basic principle of all of the great faith traditions of the world. And it's something that you can see in the eyes of every newborn that comes into this world, looking for where can I find love? Where can I find this connection? And uh, when, we, when we become in love with the things that we've created and forget the things that the mystery that created us gives us, we, we're on the wrong bus. So let's get on the right bus and come back to our, as Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell said in their fabulous discussion of nuclear weapons, remember your humanity, forget the rest. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, love human, not humans, not things. We are value creatures, move from the head to the heart. Uh, it was an amazing uh, speech, uh, Jonathan, and um, it is uh, always uh, uh, challenging, difficult to be able to allow uh, the heart to conquer uh, the mind without losing the ability to use the mind. Um, I'm sure we, we can publish what you just uh, uh, said to us. It was so, um, so engaging and we thank you for that. Thank you. Well, we have a lot of people who have been practicing what I've just been preaching. It's easy to say, it's hard no, to do. No, you've done and more than preaching. Come on, you've done more than preaching. You've done much more than preaching. The history of global civilization and globalization, it's a history of uh, humanity's glorious achievements and self-inflicted harms. And uh, it's a history of great complexities and uh, a history of achieving progress in the midst of crisis. You said, Jonathan, that we need to place human security in the center of all this, place the survival, livelihoods, and dignity, peace, security, development, and human rights of people as the fundamental basis of a stable and prosperous society. And we, thus, we have an extraordinary lady uh, a, a person who has many, uh, let me call it, uh, many fans, real fans, uh, uh, not just people who admire her, uh, but people who follow what she does and, and try to follow her leadership. Maria Espinoza is an academic, a diplomat, a politician, uh, with more than 30 years of professional experience in, um, in universities, non-governmental and international organizations, and in various leadership positions in her country. She's an expert in international affairs. She needs no introduction, but uh, let me just uh, introduce her <laughs> for the sake of, uh, of being polite. She's an expert in defense and security and sustainable development, environment and climate change and gender equality and indigenous uh, uh, people's rights. What we want as uh, what we want from you, um, President Espinoza, is to uh, enlighten us on the practical, uh, possible, potential implications of a people-centered and multidisciplinary paradigm on how the international community and national governments and civil society can address all these complex humans, human insecurities. Your experience is so wide ranging. 
and so successful in handling this complex uh, web of, um, of uh, um, national government, civil society and international communities that we want to hear your view about what uh, could be the underlying principles for uh, implementing the SDG and putting humans first. Okay, I was unmuting myself. First of all, thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor, for such a generous introduction. Um, I would like, of course, to start by commending the World Academy of Art and Science uh, and this partnership, happy partnership with the UN Trust Fund for Human Security and the UN office in, in Geneva. I think this dialogue series have addressed already so many critical issues, uh, climate, health, education, the central role of youth leaders, academia, the role of art and artists uh, under this overarching, pressing need for a global transformation. So that was uh, such an incredible holistic package uh, of, of, uh, of, uh, of creative thinking these days. And uh, I would like to, to start uh, by uh, just recalling the appeal by, made by the UN Secretary General for a global ceasefire uh, to focus on the true fight of our lives. And it is not only the fight against COVID-19, it is the fight about, you know, against insecurity, poverty, inequality, climate. And uh, today is a special day because we commemorate the International Day for the Elimination of Sexual Violence in Conflict, uh, in which, as we know, uh, women and girls are the most affected. So I would like to start with a special tribute to women peacekeepers, peacemakers, mediators, and my full solidarity with women and girls that are victims of violence in conflicts. So our panel today uh, addresses a fundamental issue, which is human security and transformative global leadership. The magical number for today, if you allow me, is going to be five. Five. Five opening framing ideas, five paradoxes that humanity is facing today, and five takeaways. And hopefully it will be five minutes too. So, uh, you know, in terms of the framing ideas, I think that human security it uh, should be seen as a much more than a standalone concept. Uh, it is rather a, a comprehensive perspective, a holistic people-centered approach uh, to better uh, assess, to better understand and transform the relationship between society, the economy, and the planet. It is a unifying framework that should be used to address um, the direct and root causes of insecurity. And there are many, you know, just, uh, paraphrasing President uh, Roosevelt for freedoms, uh, human security speaks about freedom of want, uh, freedom of fear, freedom uh, to live in dignity. And I would like to add perhaps two, uh, two additional elements that are, are critical. I would like to add freedom to live healthy, in peace, and in harmony with nature. Uh, perhaps this is the missing piece of the human security lens. So human security should be connected to the shared responsibility we have over our public goods, our commons, such as clean air, safe water, and more importantly now, health. Uh, health services and universal health coverage should be front and center of human security and be considered as a human right and a public good. This can be, you know, common sense, but sometimes we need to go back to the basics. Um, the number four is prevention, preparedness, and resilience are perhaps today the key words. But how to ensure that we have learned from our past mistakes? We were not prepared. We, we did not respond with the swiftness, for example, that COVID-19 required. And lastly, Today, uh, I think that this crisis, uh, this wake-up call, has given, uh, given us a golden opportunity to what we call the Build Back Better, using the lens, the conceptual toolkit of human security, the philosophy of human security, I would dare to say. So I would like to now uh, move perhaps to five paradoxes. 
Number one, uh, we leave times of material and even spiritual shortages. Jonathan was very clear on, on that. It is not only material shortages, you know, hunger is increasing, poverty and inequality are increasing, but also spiritual and value shortages. Hardship for the poorest, the refugees, the migrants, for women and girls, for elders, for persons with disabilities, for indigenous peoples. Yesterday, we just launched uh, a report on the, the COVID and the impact on indigenous peoples, and it's really frightening. And at the same time of these material and spiritual shortages, we are living a moment of abundance in ideas, in proposals, in plans, and dialogue. We have seen unprecedented spaces for dialogue, for exchange. We are not in shortage of reports, of to-do lists, of ideas, and we need to end the pandemic, of course, uh, the most important, of poverty and inequality after and during the coronavirus. The second paradox is that women, women have shown incredible strength and wise response capacity to the pandemic. From female heads of state and government to parliamentarians, mayors, health workers, and essential service providers, etc., they have been front and center of this crisis. And yet, women and girls are the most affected, either because of the exponential increase of domestic violence or doubling the unpaid domestic work, homeschooling, uh, and uh, depending on uh, salary and, and, and job uh, gender gaps that we all know that do exist. So the third paradox, in spite of the incredible advances in science and technology, that also Jonathan was referring to. Um, we have seen in, in the past 50 years unprecedented sophistication of knowledge, scientific knowledge, uh, and yet we haven't found a vaccine or a cure for COVID and for so many other illnesses. So we need to put science and knowledge to work at full speed, but not only Western knowledge. Um, I think that we need to rethink our epistemologies in a more um, intercultural perspective. Mm. We need to put science and knowledge to work at full speed, but uh, uh, for peace and not for war. Uh, I think that, for example, uh, a free and uh, universal access to the vaccine, we slowed and we know down the current outbreak and help uh, to promote global health and well being. That's, you know, going back to the basis uh, again. And I think leaders need to take science-based uh, science and informed decisions to address the pandemic, but also to address climate change and so many global challenges now and today. The fourth paradox is, uh, I want to just remind ourselves that only in few hours, uh, the European Union called a summit to fund the development of the COVID vaccine. And it was able to gather $8 billion in just few hours while the UN requested only 2 billion for the global humanitarian response plan for the poorest countries. And as I understand, there are funding hurdles of the UN right now. So resources are there, but we are having difficulties in setting the priorities and investing where it's more needed. And I don't even want to go to what Jonathan was mentioning about the $60,000 every second on weapons. Um, that's unbelievable. So we have, and, and the, the last paradox is that we have understood that a pandemic is as any other global crisis, be it climate change, the nuclear threat, violent extremism, do require concerted global action. And yet we see the rise of unilateral, nationalist, go it along responses, uh, closing borders, and xenophobia, so uh, in, in, I, I think that's an incredible paradox. And I think that we need to rethink the very concept of sovereignty as Jonathan was um, you know, brilliantly uh, explaining just before. So these are perhaps the, the five paradoxes, but also we are in a time as mentioned of opportunity and creativity. I think that the pandemic has had profound impact, not only because of its devastating effects in the economy, in human lives and lifestyles, but perhaps, uh, as I already mentioned, more importantly, it has unleashed an unprecedented creativity, solidarity and cooperation.
in a, I would like to close uh, with these five takeaways. We know that the resources and the money are out there. Uh, you know, there has been uh, the uh, promise of more than $12 trillion for recovery of the pandemic, the US, uh, the European Union, China, etc. But investment has to be wiser, greener, and fairer. It's not only about numbers. It's not an arithmetic choice. It is a choice mm -hmm. of wisdom mm -hmm. and generosity. So we, we have to learn to invest in the basics, strong public health systems, food security, quality education. It really pays off, and we learned that uh, with the pandemic. The number two takeaway, we hear that we need to build back better, that we cannot afford to do business as usual. And that's why we need a globally agreed checklist, a common denominators for building back better, because sometimes it's scary. You know that from the trillions of dollars, only 0.2% are targeted towards decarbonization and, and, and to revert the climate crisis, just to mention um, one of the issues. So we need a globally agreed checklist, common denominators for building back better. We have our starting point, and our starting point, our roadmap, are the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030. And we have only 10 years to deliver. So we have to work towards decarbonized economy, access to universal health coverage, resilience in societies that are better based in fairness, equality, justice. And we need a global Green New Deal, seriously. And, and the human security lens uh, is extremely important and useful. Uh, it, it is an ideal tool for this uh, checklist, global checklist for building back better. The number uh, three takeaway is that uh, we, we know pretty much what to do and how to do it. And I think that the weak part of the equation seems to be leadership and global governance arrangements we need to deliver here and now. So the institutional architecture that we need, the retooling of our multilateral system. And I think the UN 75 global dialogue is a golden opportunity to collectively decide and define the UN we need and the future we want together. Uh, the fourth takeaway would be that uh, I, I strongly believe that leadership is sorely needed, but it has to come from the whole of society. It is not only governments or messianic leaders, but social activists, women, journalists, opinion makers, scientists, artists, indigenous leaders. We all have a role to play in building a new social contract. Uh, between, and this new social contract has to be between society, the economy, politics, and nature a global Green New Deal, and I insist on that. So we have the responsibility to collectively craft uh, a new culture of multilateralism, of cooperation and solidarity, a multilateral system that is inclusive, that is efficient, relevant, accountable, and truly connected to people's needs and lives. And I would end by that. Thank you. Sorry, I was unmuting myself. Indeed, thank you very much. Resources and money are out there. Investments need to be greener, wiser, focusing on um, uh, decarbonization, food security, quality education. We need to recover better and the uh, human security lens is an ideal tool. Uh, indeed, we need how and we know what and how, but we need leadership in driving the pathway to um, uh, a sustainable world. And uh, we need to figure out our institutional architecture. I, I, I find your words uh, 
uh, why is because uh, we need the institutions to be able to respond to the great challenges. We need the UN to be uh, um, to have a structure that can respond to the challenge of the COVID, of the inequality, of climate change, and so on. And leadership needs to come from all. Uh, from the whole of the society, a new social contract indeed. I, I want to move to the next speaker now and uh, build on all you have said, but I am um, tempted to uh, ask you a very, uh, to ask you to very briefly respond to the following question that came from Richard Jordan. And it says from the former PGA, um, we should mention the outstanding leadership of Ecuador in the run-up to the Rio Earth Summit. And he's referring to Yolanda Cacapatze and in Ambassador Gallegos in the successful negotiation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability. And the question is, why does Ecuador, such a small state, produce leaders such as yourself and these two great individuals? How do you do it there? Very yeah. briefly. <laughs> That's an incredible question. I never thought about that. I, my my short uh, shorthand response should be that there is uh, greatness in smallness. So great countries are not about GDP or square kilometers. Ecuador is a small country, a small country, but you know has had an, a tremendous contribution. Uh, to strengthen multilateralism, uh, to strengthen uh, global leadership, uh, to to craft uh, our our agenda for sustainable development, and and I feel very very proud that I I am uh, the daughter of this uh, tradition in in a way. You know, um, uh, Ecuador has made a difference uh, on the rights of persons with disabilities, on the environmental agenda. Uh, hopefully, Ecuador will continue to lead uh, this effort that I had the privilege to chair myself as ambassador to the UN in Geneva uh, for a new treaty, a legally binding treaty on transnational corporations and human rights and so many other initiatives. So there is greatness in smallness. <laughs> That's nice to hear. Coming uh, from Cyprus, a very small island in the Mediterranean, it, it, it's nice to hear. But uh, indeed, Ecuador uh, uh, shows incredible leadership. Um, I'm moving now to another uh, a woman that uh, has been a role model uh, for, for many other women, but also for many other people. Mafila Ramfile, co-president of the Club of Rome, fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science, a South African politician, an activist against racism, a medical doctor, an academic, a businesswoman, former vice chancellor at the University of Cape Town, where I had the honor and privilege to visit and teach for a small period of time, and a managing director at the World Bank. I need not say much more. Uh, it's, uh, it's a privilege to have you with us. And I wanted to specifically ask you because you are uh, a, obviously an academic, but also a woman that acts on her uh, beliefs and her values. What concrete actions can we take to advance the application of human security? And how can this advancement help in building effective strategies and organizations and social movements at the different levels, the global level, the national level, the local level. Thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction. I'm going to very briefly talk to the origins of the human security concept 
and its expanded nature. And I'm going to ask us a very simple question. How do we define this humanity in the concept of human security? And how do we unlearn the unspoken values shaping our social relationships? And finally, how do we learn to dance together for a more secure human future? I just want to preface that with the history of human security in the UN. As we know, it was introduced into the Human Development Index in 1994, and then expanded by Amatasen and Sadako Ogata in the, uh, the commission on, in 2003. But the most important aspects of the expansion of this idea was to, Amatasen specifically wanted to make sure that this concept is extended to the reinforcement of human dignity, the expansion of people's horizons beyond survival, to matters of love, culture, faith, and the development of human capabilities to be able to make appropriate choices and to act. So my question is, how well have we done over the last 17 years to advance that agenda? COVID-19 has exposed our fragilities as a human community. It is like a mirror that's been held in front of us and their scars, their wounds on our face, all self-inflicted. In seeking security in overconsumption and in competition over who's got the biggest, the fastest of whatever, as we heard about the mad and the sad uh, agenda of, of the arms deal, it's really a sad commentary on humanity's failure to secure its own future. At another level, we have seen, particularly in the US, even in my own country, a resurgence of racism and its violence against the very idea of a human community, which is about being inextricably connected. So we no longer know ourselves as human beings without qualifying uh, our fragmented identities. Is it not time to reflect? And so I would like us to start by exploring what is humanity. It is amazing that with all the science we have, with all of the genetics we, we know, we still talk about different races, we still talk about multiracialism. We still talk about racial tolerance. Why are we so married to this fragmented notion of humanity and the color coding that goes with it, which bedevils our relationships? My own country, South Africa, continues to treat citizens in distinct, as distinct groups, color coded groups, despite what our constitution says about healing those divisions. The struggle to transcend racism is compounded by our unwillingness to look it in the eye and call its name. Racism is a tool invented with the specific intention of commandeering the benefits of natural and other resources by those who ascribe to themselves a superior status based on an array of characteristics. For good measure, missionaries who accompanied the, who accompanied the colonial conquerors devalued the spiritual and belief systems of indigenous people, whether it was in Africa or in Asia, everywhere. And instead imposed upon indigenous people belief systems that enable conquer, conquerors to plunder the resources and to destroy the anchors of the security of the people 
the indigenous people of these various areas. So when you look at the African continent, despite what we talk about Ubuntu, we kill each other. We are, because we have, our humanity has been destroyed inside us. The Americas and other Asian and, uh, Asian and other areas. So the continuing impact of the culture of humiliating people in order to dominate them by othering them. This has resulted in inferiority complexes, loss of self-confidence, and the loss of freedom in the very sense of that word. Almost all indigenous cultures in the world share a worldview that all life represents an inextinguishable light spark that inextricably links us in an interdependent ecosystem with all of life, not just human life, all of life. So severing any of these links destabilizes the ecosystem. And that's why the viruses, the fragments have come out of the, the woodworks. Now, what we also know from science, from neuroscientists is that of all the indignities you can inflict on people, humiliation has got the most devastating impact because it, it dehumanizes those that you are humiliating, but also dehumanizes the person who humiliates others. If you don't believe this, think about the man who was putting his knee on the neck of George Floyd. He put his hand in his pocket because he wanted distance between this human being and himself. So he became a thing sitting on a thing. The same thing with Colin Koza in South Africa, and the same thing with all of the abusers of women and children around the world. They take away their own humanity and that of their. So the human in human security can only be restored if we acknowledge the incompatibility of being human and speak of human races. To be human is to be inextricably linked to others. Second part is how do we unlearn the unspoken values undermining our social relationships as human beings? Our fragmented view of humanity is reflected in the way we refer to one another. We talk about the developed and the developing world, the West and the East, and they talk about the West in the same breath, the US and Australia. Now explain to me geographically, how is it possible that a country in the East can be West? But this is the speak which we have accepted. And we also talk about Western science. Excuse me, I thought science was invented in my continent. So how the, has it become Western? It was there, the wisdom of science is there in Asia. It, why is it people talk about Western knowledge? Which knowledge is this? I thought it was just had human knowledge. And so these divisions that we have built into our, even our development speak, the way we talk of one another, have created huge ideological walls so that the, those dominating the global system can, can continue to set the standards and to say to the world that they are the people who are the standard against which we can measure the rest of us. And that brings me to my, what do we do now? And I'm asking, that we tap into indigenous knowledge. How do we dance ourselves into a more human future? And I use this dance metaphor because in, a, in indigenous communities, when there is unease, they beat the drum. When one enters the liminal space, whether it's the birth of a child, the death, 
the marriage, uh, whatever liminal space you are in, the drum beat helps you to mm -hmm. settle. I think we also have to take a leaf out of Donella Meadows, who wrote, who, who made a huge contribution to the limits to growth. That was a report to the Club of Rome that was a warning so many years ago, we didn't listen and look at what we looked like. Now she had 14 guidelines of this dance that she was, uh, <coughs> she was going to with complex systems because that's what she was. Now I'm just reducing that to only six elements of a dance as I know it on the African continent. First, get the beat, rock and roll with the rhythm of life and let it sends us to places we are afraid to go to. But in a dance, you do things you didn't think you would be able to do. Second, learn the wisdom of the system. Human beings are wired to be connected. So if we just listen to the wisdom inside each one of us, we will go and seek those connections. And when we do that, we connect, interconnectedness is a life giving and a life receiving process. Third, let's expose the mental models to open air. Let's not have them somewhere hidden. Let's put them in conversations. And on this continent, when we have conversations, we sit in a circle. So I can see your eyes. So whatever you say, if it's not coming from the heart, I can see from the, from the eyes. So indigenous cultures everywhere use a circle as a safe space, but also a space that contains everything. There is no hierarchy in that space. All ideas are important. Fourth, stay humble and stay a learner. You know, dance, you've got lots of moves. So humility and learning will really make you get into the groove and improve. But Humility and learning creates opportunities to be more receptive. And surprising ideas come when you've got the right attitude. First, pay attention to what's important. Of all the dramas of COVID-19, the one thing it has forced us to do is to pay attention to what matters. And what matters in life is well-being of people and the planet. And finally, expand the horizons of time, thought, and caring. So as the young people in the streets of the US and everywhere say Black Lives Matter, let us think beyond the known and the narrow that have brought us to this crisis that we are in. But if we expand our horizons, we will then be able to relearn how to care for people and the planet and how to be fully that which was we were created to be. So let me conclude. Human security is only possible in community. Restoring our community as a human race, single human race, is the first step. Our interconnectedness will then provide the circle in which we can dance together. As we expand the horizons, we have deliberately narrowed to shut out those we call the other. In such a dancing circle, there will be enough for all as we learn from the rest of nature of which we are a part to take only what we need and allow others to equally enjoy the dance of life. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, people want to applause. Uh, you can see them that they are clapping their hands. I'm gonna read the amazing comment uh, of uh, Mila uh, Popovic. She says, 
thank you, Dr. Mama Pila, for deconstructing the terms of discussion that are at the roots of discriminatory, dividing, depleting politics and economics. Deconstructing, unlearning, unveiling is the precondition for building better and evolving. Thank you for bringing up the metaphor of dance as well as the practice of dancing, moving together that is essential for community building, trust building, holistic development. Thank you for your leadership. I couldn't have said it better, that's why I read the comments and it is not the only great comment um, that you uh, provoked. <laughs> Uh, from your engaging uh, contribution. Truly, we need to uh, invest on what matters, the well-being of people and the planet. We need to think big and uh, demolish all that is divide, uh, dividing us and uh, for human security, as you said, to dominate, we need to um, invest in community building. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your inspiring uh, contribution. I will now move to Dr. Chantal Lyne Cabedier, Chief of the New York United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. Prior to 2014, this woman was actively involved in the successful negotiations of the Sustainable Development Goals for the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs, and she facilitated the amazing uh, participation of more than 10,000 non-state actors um, in the UN Rio Plus 20 Conference on Sustainable Development. She was also um, uh, the uh, Division for Sustainable Development uh, Goals Focal Point for Sustainable Consumption and Production, Food Security, and Sustainable Agriculture. It is an honor to have you with us, and uh, I would like uh, to ask you, what do you think, and in particular in the SDG on production, on responsible production and consumption. Uh, what do you think are the imp implications of a people-centered trust disciplinary paradigm um, for how we can organize the international community and national governments? Uh, how do you conceptualize um, our ability to invest in sustainable production and consumption um, through the institutions that we have in place? Or is it a matter that we need other institutions, more embracing, more engaging institutions? The floor is yours. Thank you so, um, so much, Madam Chair. And uh, it's a tough act to do to follow um, the President of General Assembly and Ms. Ranfele, honestly. So, um, but your questions are, are very, um, very important. And I think we all would agree that without um, human security is not possible without economic and social stability. And what we are seeing now is both. Um, we already had a um, social instability with people feeling the unfairness of the economic, financial, and trade system that we have right now, these people being on the street um, before even the COVID hit, uh, because the system that we have basically is geared towards um, most benefit going to the most privileged and uh, not people-centered. And uh, uh, Mrs. Pizinoza, our president, uh, former president, mentioned that we need to have people-centered uh, system. I think the, the we, some people have also mentioned the opportunity, including uh, Mrs. Spinoza, but what the, I see a big window of opportunity here because we had lost track. Remember when we started in Cuba to talk about in the first conference on trade, the, the, the principle, the most important objective for trade was first for nation, and that came from um, before, the, the first, sorry, let's backtrack. After the war, right, we create all these institutions to avoid war. 
And of course, the avoidance of war and conflict doesn't mean peace, but you basically, it's one of the first steps. And then in Cuba, the old idea for the first conference was about workers and creating job and creating decent job. That was the first idea behind our trade system. And we, that conference never failed. And then when we went ahead, we forgot that focus. That, and then when we talk about workers and we talk about uh, decent salaries, then it's the humanity into this, right? As a worker, as a, a person, because we define ourselves mostly as worker and what we do in our, in our society. And we lost track of that. And yet now when we look at the impact, the tremendous impact, and I'm just going to run you quickly to some, because Antad has just released three reports on this. We're looking at economic contraction of 6% of GDP, foreign direct investment flow forecasted to decrease by 40%. And by the way, a lot of these flows coming out already from developing countries that can't print money of their own like we're doing Global value of merchandise trade expected to decrease by 27% from Q1, not just for the whole year, just from Q1, which was already down 3%. And so we basically then look at who's going to benefit and who's going to pay the most. Well, we saw the tremendous billion that um, Amazon um, has, has um, uh, accumulated since the beginning of this, of this uh, crisis. And now as the COVID is hitting a lot of developing countries, their economy is already shadow uh, because the lockdown of population has basically created the most, the unprecedented level of unemployment worldwide. And a lot of workers in developing countries do not have social protection. They're in, in a informal economy. And if they have to stay home, they can't make a, an earning and they can't feed their family. Um, we are predicting an 8 billion loss in terms of export uh, from developing countries as a lot of countries are putting protectionism, um, protecting barriers uh, on a lot of goods and services. And I already mentioned the capital outflow from uh, developing countries that has decreased their foreign current, their currencies, which mean now they have to pay their debt which is tremendous uh, in a currency that is low and then a, a, a debt that is dominated in US dollars. And so what does that mean? That means that a lot of the, the, the gain we made over the last few decades in poverty, hunger, malnutrition, unemployment, public services, education are at risk of all being lost. And so the opportunity I see President Espinoza said, by building people-centered economic, financial, and trade system, as the SDGs calling for, um, and leaving that leaves no one behind. And what does that mean? And I think part of humanity is to leave no one behind. We're all one race. We're all one people. So we can't accept uh, ethically to leave anyone behind. And what I find interesting in the work of the Club of Rome is their report, the report on transition is possible towards the SDGs, and they define the five steps that get us there. And yet, for some reason, a lot of people are not paying enough attention to those. And two of them, the first two, are massive investment in agriculture, in nutritious and um, sustainable agriculture and massive investment in decarbonization and in um, renewable energy. We have massive investment being made now. We have up our developing, our develop, the developed nation that have the capacity to print money, have announced so far $8 trillion of support to their economy. That does three things. One, it means this is a no matter how you look at it, this is more than the GDP of the bottom 50 countries. So no matter where that money goes, that means the competitiveness of the small and medium enterprises in developing and emerging economy, which create job, are now less able even than before to compete with the multinational. And we see, we're gonna see, unless we, we pay attention to it, a major continuation of the concentration of our market and the power into the hands of the few multinationals. The second thing um, that we're seeing that is, is this reshoring or shortening of the supply chain because 
of the resilience that uh, a lot of people are asking for. We saw that some countries could not have access to masks or to protective gear because we shut down the port, we shut down some, some um, uh, supply chain. And so there will be, and there's an important, there will be, uh, our, our decision maker will be under a lot of pressure to shorten those supply chain and do have contract with companies that will be able to shift their production. And the most costly way to do this will be to reshore because that create that cuts the job from developing countries. The best way would be to have shortened supply chain and regional further and regional integration with those countries. So they are the and, and increase in stock um surplus um stocks um of, of the essential good at the regional level produce at the regional level and yet within a trade system that's multilateral because the rules are good for the small countries. They're not good, they, they, they don't help the big country. Now we're heading towards bilateralism of all these trade agreements and these, and these agreements. It's not gonna help the small, uh, the small countries because they have no way, they have no ability to actually negotiate a, a, with, a, with the US or the EU on, on the one by one. And that's why we created the multilateral trade system. Don't take me wrong. The trade system that we have right now is biased against developing countries and we need to fix it, but we have the opportunity to fix it. Now, it is something we've been trying about to do for the last 30 years and now we have an opportunity to do it. And I wouldn't want us to miss this opportunity to, to do this because the COVID comes after we already have a lot of disruption in supply chain because of the technological changes like IoT and, and uh, robotics and, and uh, AI, which allow for um, shortening of and customizing of product and reshoring of a lot of the iTech goods. So at UNCTAD, what we're calling for is basically we need to preserve and restore trade. Um, the flow of goods. Um, so, because if there's no flow of goods, there's no flow of investment. And there's very little ways that developing countries can actually have the fiscal space they need to actually invest in the education and the health of their people right now. Um, we also need to have the debt standstill that UNCTAD has been calling for uh, in the short term and forgiving of some of the debt and not on a per capita basis, but on, on a risk basis. Um, does debt forgiveness need to be done? Um, what about solidarity? Where did solidarity go? We are having these trillions of dollars we're putting out. How are we putting, you know, what's the percentage is going to de help developing countries? It's a fraction. And yet, and I was, I'm going to quote somebody so I don't get in trouble. I was on a call, I was on a webinar with uh, Pascal Lamy and uh, Zurich yesterday on the future of trade. Uh, Zurich is the former uh, US trade representative. And they basically, Pascal Lamy literally said, look, if you're gonna destroy all the MSMEs and the job in Africa, don't expect them not to come to Europe. So you have to choose between not having people migrate or helping those countries. And so I, I think it's, we are, we're living in a global world and it is our duty to help the, the developing countries to keep these jobs and help their MSMEs. So I would add to the Club of Rome's five things. So the first two I mentioned, the third of course is, and you got, you got you know, this call know all this, but I think it's important for people that may not know. Uh, the third is of course, uh, in addressing the inequalities. Um, the, the fourth is changing our economic, financial and trade system. And the fifth is um, the uh, gender equality and economic empowerment of women, which we have, I believe, a chance to do if we make enough noise and enough pressure on our, our member states and our countries that they target a lot of these stimulus towards MSME, uh, women-owned MSMEs, um, that they put conditionality on these, on, on these um, resources. So for instance, in Canada, the oil and gas industry can get grants, but to get the grants, they actually have to do a um, scope tree reporting What's that? That means they have to report the carbon implication of their uh, production all the way down to their suppliers. And this is something we've been trying to fight for, to have these companies to report and disclose. So let's use this as an opportunity to unblock a lot of the area where we've not been able to advance because of some of the richest countries preventing us from doing it. Um, in agriculture, developing countries have a competitive advantage in agriculture. We've been trying to reform the agricultural sector forever, and yet we have no movement. Now we have a chance to address this because otherwise we're going to have 
uh, a risk of having a food insecurity in a lot of countries. So I'll leave it that there, but I think we have, a, I, I have to side as usual with our, our president and Mrs. Espinoza that we have a chance to rebuild better, but we can only do it together. This is, this is indeed very interesting and of course, uh, very consistent to what we economists think. At the moment, do, do you see actual action towards uh, rebuilding, towards a more sustainable value chain and also um, streamlining, guiding developing countries to invest in regenerating ag agriculture and uh, secure um, uh, food? Do, do you see uh, actions uh, really happening at, at this uh, last three, four months uh, during the pandemic? Very quickly, but I, yeah. I, I need quickly to know. The quickly the hope I think comes from the EU at this point. You know, we we've all noticed some people like that. Yeah, we have a total vacuum of leadership, right? And now even the DG of, of the WTO is the has resigned. And so and the EU is busy missing in action, let's say it, right? Okay. Uh, each have done their own thing and now they're coming finally back together. Um, and it, you know, they've been distracted with Brexit and other things, but now they're coming back together. They have their green plan, their green new plan. Uh, the Prince of Wales announced the great reset. And he's getting a lot of attention on this. And all of this is about what we have been talking about. Circular economy, green economy, all the way down the supply chain to our producers of cacao and coffee and others in, in, in those countries. Um, and what they're serious about now and talking seriously about, and it, it's allowed by the very behavior of what the U.S. have been doing by withdrawing the dispute settlement because by not nominating judges, they're seriously considering having carbon uh, border adjustment. And But with the discussion is what's interesting at this point is they, re they learn from the last 10 years and they're considering the impact on their supplier and their, the developing countries and seeing perhaps that some of the money we collected at, as a tariff needs to be redistributed to developing countries. And again, we need to pay attention to that to ensure that really some of that money, because they're going to get a lot of pressure not to. But I think there's... I, please, please. No, 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 please. no, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. I talk too much. I, I'm, very, uh, I'm very happy that you referred to the European Green Deal and the uh, next generation EU recovery plan and all we try to do in Europe. I'm so heavily involved there that I'm sometimes wondering whether uh, other international organizations uh, really believe that uh, there is some uh, leadership coming uh, from there. I'm, I'm really happy that you endorsed uh, this. But it is, of course, important to disseminate and diffuse the uh, positive uh, welfare benefits uh, to uh, developing countries and also engage them in the same process of uh, recovering better. Thank you so much. It was very Thank interesting. You. I'm very close to my heart as an economist. Um, I would uh, now like to move to our next pa uh, panelist. At last, uh, a, a male. That, this is a very interesting uh, panel uh, that uh, has uh, uh, as many women as men, and it is uh, good to see this symmetry. So, um, Douglas Roche. Uh, former Canadian senator, parliamentarian, diplomat, author, the founder and chairman emeritus of Middle Powers Initiative. Um, this is an international network of uh, eight international non-governmental organizations specializing in nuclear disarmament issues. Um, I like this part of his TV, so I will refer to it. In 2010, the city of Hiroshima na named him an honorary citizen for his extensive nuclear disarmament work, and particularly for founding the Middle East, Middle Powers Initiative. He also received many awards for peace and non-violence, including the Mahatma Gandhi Foundation for World Peace Award, the CV is endless, and uh, thank you for sharing uh, your wisdom with us. Um, how important 
how important is education uh, in trying uh, to embrace humanity and lead the way to sustainability? Um, we have again uh, Richard uh, Jordan uh, asking me to direct uh, this uh, question to you um, and uh, ask you to elaborate on the role of global education associates in articulating uh, the idea of human security. Well, hello to all. Um, hello. Thank, thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm speaking to you from um, my home in uh, Edmonton in uh, Western Canada, uh, where it's still morning and uh, the uh, sun is shining out my window, the flowers are in bloom, and I feel uh, very happy today. Um, I also feel happy in a broader sense than merely my physical condition today. Because I recognize that I and we are living at a fabulous moment in world history. Although, if you look at the headlines of the news every day, it doesn't appear so. But I want to speak to you today about this powerful moment in world history that has come upon us and that we are privileged to participate in. This is the first time in the history of the world that humanity being confronted with huge problems, I speak only at the moment of nuclear weapons and climate change that threaten humanity, but we also, for the first time, possess the instruments, the basis on which humanity can come together to resolve its problems. This is the first time that uh, humanity has had such an opportunity. When society moved from hunter-gatherers to the agriculture age. When the agriculture age gave way to the industrial age, when industrialism moved to the technological age, these were major moments and shifts in the common human experience. And today we are going through a similar transformation of great magnitude, namely a move from the old culture of war to a new culture of peace. Again, if you look only at the headlines superficially, you will be discouraged. But if we step back for a moment and look at the trend line, the arc of history for the past 200 years, we have seen ourselves engaged in wars of one kind or another that kept holding back humanity. But we have built a system through the United Nations, its 40 agencies reaching into every area of human activity. It would take up all my allotted time here just to start naming the, all, all the agencies that you know so well. But why this moment is important to step back and realize our potential is precisely because of the COVID pandemic. A terrible, terrible blight on humanity in which many people are suffering. And I pay my respects sincerely to all those who are so sadly afflicted by the COVID. But it is at the same time a teaching moment for us. It is teaching us our common vulnerability, 
no matter whether we live in the East or the West, no matter whether we're Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, or Jewish, no matter whether we're black, white, whatever our race, whatever our geography, whatever our background, we have the same blood in us that is susceptible to a virus which knows no passports and crosses uh, international boundaries at will. And so through the, our common vulnerability, we realize on a very, very human level that we must cooperate and work together. Now the idea of cooperation is not exactly new. The, um, the philosophers and theologians uh, down through the ages uh, ha have been telling us this at a vertical line of teaching. But today, horizontally, as we're spread out around the world, we are recognizing our vulnerability through the COVID. And so we have to have some common security. And we have to get rid of mass, uh, uh, mass uh, weapons of mass destruction. We need to understand how to find our way from this culture of war to a culture of peace so that we are all safe. And there has been tremendous movement forward over the past 20, 30 years, 40 years, certainly since the end of the Cold War. We, we, are, we are finding our way uh, forward. Earlier in this program, in this webinar, it was said that uh, a ref reference was made to uh, militarism and the costs of armaments and so on. And it was said, well, we, we don't want to go there. I would like to tell you, my friends, respectfully, that is exactly where I want to go. I want to call to our attention, it, as was made in reference to earlier, the $1.9 trillion a year that is spent on armaments um, what does that mean to our ability to respond to the needs of humanity, health, education, shelter, food? Um, what does it mean for our ability to respond to them? So, in 1987, uh, when I was the Canadian ambassador to the United Na at the United Nations, uh, there was held uh, the International Conference on the Relationship Between Disarmament and Development. And there, it, it, there were great studies made about uh, the benefits of moving on two tracks at the same time, namely a disarmament track and a development track. And the money released by the expenditure of arms and transferred to development process, the more you had disarmament, the more you had development, the greater was the security for all. That was called a dynamic triangular relationship. And there are great studies in the UN on this, on this theme. Progress then, but the Western nations were uh, opposed to the creation of a fund that would have been created by moving money from arms to development. So at least they recognized the concept. We had the commission of Olaf Palme in the 1980s that showed that um, uh, nobody is safe in the world in the age of weapons of mass destruction if we are not all safe. We cannot have a continuation of nationalistic policies in which my side gets more nuclear arms than your side, and your side wants to get more than mine, we have a nuclear race. This is not a way in which we can project the safety of people nor is it a way that we can use the best resources of the world. Well, we have not sufficiently learned that lesson. 
And so today, $100 billion a year are being spent on nuclear weapons, weapons that cannot be used and that are uh, immoral in the greatest magnitude of that word, the complete obliteration of humanity in the areas where, that were, where it would be affected. So fortunately, while all this has been going on, there has been the development of a global conscience. There is a conscience that is very much um, discernible in the world today. It, it lies in all those in the many streams of both governments. There are many good governments. Not all governments are bad. There are many good governments. Um, and the, the, the advanced thinking processes of civil society in its many dimensions, I don't want to start to elaborate here, um, in which we are recognizing more and more, we have to care for one another and care for the planet. This was never done before. The Universal Declaration on Human Rights has given way, in, in, in my own lifetime, the, the Declaration of Human Rights has given way, has, 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 has given way to, to uh, the construction of many laws for the protection of people of minorities, well, different, different variations of minorities. Uh, the whole question of women's rights has come to the forefront. Um, the, uh, the three uh, top figures at the United Nations working with, uh, with Antonio Guterres are all women. I and mean, I could go down a long line of how women are, are have, have, have it, it's not just a question of any, any longer of the protection of women, which of course is necessary, but more the participation of women fully in the diplomatic and political processes in, in, in public policy decision making. This is part of the global conscience that, has, that, that, that is arising. When we see on the streets around the world, not just in the United States, but around the world now, demonstrations, um, the most recent round of demonstrations, sparked, as you will, by the murder of a black man by a white police officer. Um, the extent of those demonstrations was much deeper than racial injustice, bad as racial injustice is. The theme that has propelled those marches, those demonstrations, has been a quest to end inequalities, the, the inequities, a quest for economically, the que a quest for social justice. All this is part of the global conscience. This is a very powerful movement, and it has given birth to the culture of peace. In the United Nations, the culture of peace was well defined in 1999 and 2000, and a whole decade was set out for a whole decade was set out between 2001 and 2010 uh, to advance the, uh, all the various aspects and programs for a culture of peace centering on nonviolence, the, the bringing forward of nonviolence as a, as a basic construct on how we live. And of course, along came 9-11 in 2001, and there was a quick reversion to militarism. So what we have seen since 2001 is the surge of militarism and, and, and local wars, and bombings and so on. Um, uh, the, this surge of militarism has now got out of control as we've gone through the first two decades of this century and it's got out of control because we have not had sufficiently good political leadership to lead people to recognize, to lead people on a mass scale um, toward uh, uh, the prioritization of funding for instruments of peace rather than instruments of war. So we still have an arms trade today of outlandish proportions. The people of Yemen and Syria have suffered from the arms trade that, that, that uh, the military industrial complex has made money off of the moral opposition to those who are making money off of war is still not strong enough, but there is an opposition to it. 
that also is the a reflection of a global of a global conscience so we have to move and recognize that the single biggest obstacle that we still face in this world that covid has told us how vulnerable we are we have to work together we have to have more money for social uh, development areas the sustainable development goals we require immense amounts of money immense amounts of money and working with the private sector the single biggest obstacle is the retention of militarism in uh, our political thinking we've got to find a way out of it I have suggested on several in several areas, several programs like this that I've been on, um, could we think in terms of even a modest 10% reduction in military expenditures? What would that mean? On $1.9 trillion military expenditures, 10% uh, of that, uh, the world couldn't live with 10% uh, with less in the whole uh, in the military structure. We couldn't live with 10% less? Well, 10% less would be $190 billion, $190 billion. Now, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, God bless him for his efforts for ceasefire and trying to bring our attention to the need uh, to have uh, um, uh, the resources increased for health and, and uh, particularly meeting the COVID responses. Um, has asked for $2 billion. Well, uh, that $2 billion is this is minor uh, uh, sum of money compared to what, what the need is. When one considers that the entire United Nations system, I'm speaking here of the peacekeeping, not just the administration, the peacekeeping, the work of all the programs, UNICEF, UNDP, UNHCR, all the programs put together, $30 billion a year, $30 billion a year. That's 2.6% of what the world spends on military armaments. So the gross disproportion of what we are spending on arms and what we are spending on the, on the instruments of peace is a reflection that although a global conscience has been born and is, is operating, I've tried to say it is operating, it is not yet sufficiently strong and thus I call on all of us, the people who are like us, who, who work in our, in, uh, the people who, who work in, our, uh, in, 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 uh, in all our fields, uh, that we, uh, uh, concentrate our thinking on uh, making our policies uh, more human-centered and less militaristic-centered. Finally, you, oh, sorry. Well, on, just on the United Nations, the mm -hmm. four major areas for human security are economic and social development, um, arms control and disarmament, environmental protection, and uh, advancement of human rights. So we're not lost. We're like as if we're in a jungle at midnight without a compass. We know exactly what we need to do. So we need to focus our attention on the, uh, on uh, uh, what the defined agenda of the United Nations and through all the process of education, which you started out by asking to speak on, the process of education at all levels, not only in the, in the schools, but the, the civil society uh, programs that are, some are definitively education, and many of them are education by the very fact of what they're doing. So we have to elevate our understanding in humanity of uh, what, our, uh, uh, what our capacity, uh, what our human capacity is uh, in the new age that we have entered, and that uh, elevation of humanity and human thinking is what gives me a permanent hope that we can move forward despite the headlines of the day. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Mr. Roj. Indeed, redirecting resources from um, weapons uh, to implementing the SDG agenda and uh, building on our uh, on, on human education and knowledge in order to support the implementation of this agenda. Thank you very much for an inspiring uh, intervention. And I now turn to uh, a person who is um, a leader in, uh, in finance and investment, Ketan Padel, CEO and founder of Greater Pacific Capital, um, previously a managing director in investment banking decision in Goldman Sachs, formerly a partner in KP Morgan, and currently working on a new work order, cyber attack, defense security, uh, evolving US-China leadership, all the interesting issues that are central to our geopolitical and economic uh, arena. I wanted to ask uh, how can we uh, use uh, structural funds, government funds, EU funds uh, to leverage global flows, public and private and domestic and international and redirect them to support the achievement of Agenda 2030. I would like to ask all four remaining speakers to keep to their five to six minutes so that we uh, we allow the next session to start off on time. I know it's difficult uh, when you have so many interesting experiences to convey everything in a short period of time, but you know, time oh, is... Phoebe? Yes. Um, I was, I, I, I saw the problem with time and I contacted Gary, who's the leader of the World Academy and yes. suggested that that the people who really do have to limit their time, that we have another session, that this is so rich, that the, that the interventions are so inspiring and substantive, but that we have another session that's focused on, we've, 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 everyone, has made the, everyone is making the case why, but we could have a session specifically focused on how. What are the things, what are the leverage points within our capacity as, as actors that can be done? What are the specific policies that we think would be transformative that are within our gift to advance now? That would be a sort of a different, uh, a different modality. Uh, but I, so I think we should continue in the modality that we're doing and respect the fact that the next speakers really have more than four minutes to say, as have all of the previous incredibly substantive, inspiring, over the top, fabulous speakers but that we could reconvene between now and October and continue this dialogue because I, I mean, it, it is so rich and substantive so that nobody, none of the following speakers feel a short rift. They would be the first speakers so that they will be able to fill out their ideas. Exactly, and this kind of dialogue will be instrumental in leading the way to the October conference. So we need to write all these things into, into a, a, a a press release, an article that can bring together the important points we want to figure out how to do during the uh, October conference. Phoebe, thank you. Jonathan, thank you. Phoebe, let me, um, let me try and keep it to three minutes because we're running out of time. Oh. And then we will pick but, it but up. But you will have time. opportunity again, Patel. Yeah. You'll have opportunity <laughs> again. We want so, you. Um, I, you know, so many beautiful things have been said and so many important things. Uh, have been explored in this in this short discussion. Two hours have gone so fast almost. I, I'm trying to reflect on what is the most important thing to contribute in two or three minutes. And I, I'm gonna lean back into the history of my family and where we came from in India and put forward the idea that our problem as humanity is linked to the idea of reincarnation. The simple idea is that we have to keep doing the same thing again and again until we get it right. So our history, is, as Douglas was saying earlier, you know, we have had a series of civilizations and great powers. And there is a rhythm to them. And at some point, we analyze the maths of these in our team. And what you find is every power has the same curve almost perfectly 
symmetrical in terms of its rise and fall. So throughout human history, great powers have risen and fallen. And when they start to lose their power, they seem to do the same things. They run out of resources. They fight each other and their neighbors to get more resources. They become highly destructive. Their societies are divided. And although they have the answers to their problems, they do not implement them. Now, we keep repeating this same problem and we don't seem to solve it. We do get better, so we've been so successful post the Second World War that we turned 2.4 billion people into nearly 8 billion people today. And we intend to get to 10 by 2050. So we somehow got good at creating massive economic surpluses. But we still never got good at distributing them. We got very good at building schools. We have no shortage of money. You know, there are $350 trillion of private and government wealth out there. There's no shortage of money. There's no shortage anymore of knowledge. There's no shortage of reach across the planet. But we insist on repeating the same behaviors. There's no shortage even of initiatives that could solve all these problems, whether it's in the UN or the WHO or anywhere else, in laboratories, in R&D functions, in think tanks. We have the answers to everything. Yet we arrive in this century and within 10 years, it looks like we're willing to throw it away because we are so divided. We would almost dismantle every international institution by defunding it from the great powers that run the world rather than solve our own problems. So why is that? And, and given time is so short, I'm gonna do it in 30 seconds to a minute. And I, I think it's because we did not invest in building the awareness, the consciousness of what a great human being is in every human being on the planet. So we turned people in the industrial era into cogs in the machinery of building product. Then as capital arrived and know-how and science arrived, we displaced the human beings with machines. And so we turned our people into machines and then we made them redundant. And then two thirds of our people on the planet are not participants in this economy as we build it now because they don't have bank accounts and they can't participate. Our education system taught them the science, the maths, so many things, even the humanities, but left them as cogs because we did not show them how to build compassion for everybody of every creed and every belief set. And so we're open to populists and people who want to betray the truth, to drive a wedge in the middle of us so we cannot unite. So I don't think the problem, Phoebe, and I haven't answered your question exactly. The problem's not about the money. We have enough money. We have enough ideas. The problem is we have not invested at the core of the education system in building real humanity. Our whole system is designed to pass a series of tests that are systemically designed to get us to the next stage just by memorizing things and learning formulae, but not building true humanity inside us. And without that, we're doomed to do it again and again and again. Uh, I'll stop there because... Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, Jonathan can confirm how much I agree with you. Uh, before the beginning of, the, uh, of this session, we've been talking about the demonia and Aristotelian delos and what is our, uh, what is the meaning of humanity? What does it mean to be human? What is our purpose? This, and, is, the uh, this is the real dialogue we need to have with the youngest people and everybody in society, whether we like each other or not. What does it mean to be a human being and to care? Even the people that are putting their knees on the necks of all of us, we have to have that dialogue. We have to find the ways to do it. We'll find exactly. the, the rest of it, I'm sure. That's a separate project. That's a big, interesting, uh, amazing project. And uh, we are doing something on that with uh, the Pontifical Academy of Science, UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, 
and Confucius uh, Institute in uh, Beijing. But I will uh, move to our next speaker, and I hope I will get some time to speak about that in some other occasion, uh, who has a lot to say about what we are saying now. He's been called the spiritual advisor, uh, the um, shaman of Wall Street, man of two worlds. Uh, his name is Lawrence Ford, the CEO and founder of Cautious Capital Wealth Management and, the, and an author, speaker, and spiritual leader. He, a leader. he dedicated much of his life to being a bridge between the modern world of business and the ancient world of wisdom. Through these two words, he's helping people and organizations wake up and remember that they are here for a reason. What is the reason that we are here? Thank you. We are, and we are so deeply honored to have you with us. Ah, well, it is likewise. And I am so happy to see so many old friends and new friends. And I thank the World Academy of Arts and Sciences and this most sacred of all sacred places on the globe, the United Nations, for this. Um, well, as always, things work in perfect harmony. So, uh, Keitan, you, you pretty much did half of what I was going to say, so I can be very brief. And all of the other lovely comments that were out there is really leaning in this direction. So I will be brief, and um, I look forward to us talking in the future about solutions and hard solutions, but let me really address the why. And it's what we were just saying. And the why is we have forgotten, completely fallen asleep and forgotten what our greatest asset is. And we have also fallen asleep as a species. And so, let me just address the greatest asset first, and then we'll talk about falling asleep for a moment. So each one of us, the way that I see the world, and I think that most of us see the world with our own different languaging, is that we are all truly here for a reason. We all have a very special gift. And our job in life is to express that gift out to the world and to help support others do the same. When we do that, we have inner peace. And when we have inner peace, we have outer peace. And sometimes the things in the world of the economy and academia and finance in general and all of the different languages that we use around the planet make things so incredibly complicated and difficult. But really at the end of the day, that is our greatest asset and we have fallen asleep and we have forgotten about that. Fortunately, uh, cycles of life have their ways with us and occasionally as individuals or as a collaborative group of species, we are woken up for a while. And as many of my esteemed panelists have said and mentioned before, that COVID-19 in its complete misery and sadness is also an incredible gift for a moment for all of us to wake up and realize that number one, we are completely interconnected, whether it be our breath through the virus or whether it be our economic systems. And that hopefully it gives us a pause to get off of our track of our incessant A to B running back and forth to remember what's important. As Katon mentioned prior, 350 trillion assets are running around the globe for us of which I think somewhere around, and connect, correct me if I'm wrong, Katon, but somewhere around 70% of those assets are held by households. True. So what have we done as we've fallen asleep? We've given our power away. We've forgotten we're here for a reason. We've given our power to political leaders who are so deeply invested in maintaining their power games. We have given our power for, to financial systems who are deeply invested in maximizing profit. And truly we have everything we need to have at our fingertips 
as we wake up to remember that we're all here for a reason and we can redirect that capital, whether it be the capital of the 350 trillion that's out there into the direction that we know is important, that everyone matters. And when everyone matters and feels heard and can express themselves out into the world, then we have inner peace, we have outer peace, and then we have ultimate security in our world. Thank you so much. Uh, everyone matters. That's uh, crucial for gaining inner peace. We need to have another session. I'm moving um, to our next speaker, Sergei Ordonigintze. Ord I mean, my surname is difficult, but this is slightly difficult. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Uh, a director I... general of the United Nations office in Geneva for nine years, ten years, a career diplomat has done so much. I don't have time to go through his CVs. Please tell us how this uh, intergovernmental scene is going to help us in implementing the SDGs. Thank you, in thank you very much. That's exactly what I wanted to tell what the international Geneva should, must and should do more in coping the problems before us, particularly human security. Because in a time of COVID-19 pandemic, countries must really, and, and people must really in the face of common threat. And the role of the United Nations in coping this problem is indispensable. It is also very important that the UN system organizations in Geneva, and I, I still remember how we interacted in Geneva, uh, work, the UN system organizations work closely together and coordinate their efforts to achieve synergy. For example, World Health is doing their best, coordinates with International Telecommunication Union, many other organizations, but what Geneva, international Geneva should do is to uh, take joint efforts with civil society and private sector in order to uh, cope with the problem of pandemic. And especially, especially during this difficult time, uh, nothing goes smoothly in international Geneva because we have to motivate civil society and private sector. Uh, and the bureaucracy, unfortunately, is prevailing in Geneva. Uh, I gave a, a, a good example of what World Health Organization is doing, but I cannot say some good words, any good word about ITU not about the ITU director, uh, Secretary General, not about I, uh, uh, ITU as general, uh, in, in, in general, but the working group that is uh, functioning in ITU and trying its best to prohibit the uh, international business to be of help to the United Nations, especially to the disabled people, which according to the World Health Organization is over 1 billion people. They invent all kinds of uh, procedures and intricacies in order to drag and drag and drag and drag and drag and things. But it is unbelievable what is going on because uh, persons with disabilities need help more than anyone else. And before the ITU, we have a GRAILS project uh, presented by a, a business group of uh, people. Uh, and this project is going nowhere. This project will give help in medicine, uh, help to blind, help to death, help for uh, people who can use digital uh, uh, world to find uh, friends, a job, get assistance, 
banking, medicine, this project is going nowhere. Why? I strongly believe World Health Organization should do its best to press uh, 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 its sister ITU organ, uh, organization and work in coordination with, with, with this uh, uh, organization. Because we have a personal agenda. You see, small people, technical people are sitting in the working group of ITU and they speak about little problems, hair splitting problems, uh, procedures um, like um, uh, uh, procedures and, and all these technicalities. Unfortunately, the chairman of this group from the UK is doing its best how to uh, uh, actually kill this uh, I good idea. Though the British government and the British public is strongly against such approach. I don't know what's happening at the United Nations ITU. Uh, Secretary General of the United Nations uh, very clearly said that he is uh, giving his, his helping hand to the UN and the UN system organization should work closely together and coordinate the efforts. But that is not happening at the UN in Geneva. Uh, very unfortunately, dear colleagues and friends, I hope this intolerable situation illustrates what we all should be united against and whom we should help we should help more than 1 billion disabled people in a especially difficult time of COVID-19. After all, human security starts with human being and, it, and is dependent on how every single person feels secure. That's what I wanted to tell and that is my pain, unfortunately. Thank you, Ivan. You have a lot of support in the messages. They say this is a great initiative and indeed this is something very practical that we can put forward and help at least one billion people. Uh, thank you for putting uh, this on the table and making an explicit um, uh, communicating an explicit position of how to move forward. I am moving to our last speaker, an amazing woman once again, Rama Mani, the convener of the Enacting Global Transformation Program at the CIS, the University of Oxford, the founder of the Altair of Transformation Academy, the co-founder of Home for Humanity, counselor of World Future Council, and I can go on and on, but given that we have another five minutes, please, Rama, please go ahead and give us our view on how this humanity uh, uh, the, the, the face of humanity can be our central focal point for transforming our world and thinking big in order to really change towards sustainability. Thank you so much, Professor Kunduris. I'll jump right into it. Um, I'm thrilled that this discussion has been so poetic, has been filled with a real discussion of humanity, because as I was Thinking about the session of the last couple of days, what really struck me is that, you know, my engagement with human security started when the term began, when we coined the term with the Commission on Global Governance uh, in 1992 to 95, while at the UNDP, Mahbubul Haq, Amartya Sen, Richard Jolly were coming up with this term. And my, my experience with human security has gone right through this time, whether it was with R2P, with global governance, with post-conflict justice, et cetera. And all of us, we've seen our hearts swell and our hearts weep 
with all that's happened. But in honor of my beloved friend and fellow world future, future counselor, Maria Espinosa, who is not just adored around the world in many corners for all of, you know, for being the first woman's defense minister and all kinds of incredible things, but who's also an award-winning poet, I prefer to say it with words. The one thing I do want to say as a key point um, on this point before I, sh I share it in a poem is um, I found myself struck because I'm such a devotee of human security. I've taught it, I've practiced it, wondering is human security a big enough vessel for what we want to convey in 2020? And saying, but how can we give up all that we've worked so hard to achieve at the moment that it's so under threat? And what I found myself saying, you know, I just loved it from um, uh, Professor Manfele when you talked about, you know, the dance of humanity, that, you know, humanity is so central to everything that I am and I do. And I wonder how can we deal with a word that's so anthropocentric and yet seems to embody everything that we want to stand for. And it was in realizing, and Jonathan, you pointed to it at the very beginning of the session, that humanity has embedded with, within it the word unity, meaning that we only grow into our humanity, as you beautifully expressed, Kathan, when we can be in unity with all of life, as Maria said, you know, in harmony with nature. So, and you know, our quest is how can we transform this world into a real home for humanity where we are our full human conscience, as my dear friend Lawrence stated, and we are so in unity with the dance, the unfolding dance of life of which we can become a part. So very quickly, if you'll allow me, and my way to do it so we don't overstep our time is I'm asking Gary whether, you know, I'll say the first poem, I prepared two poems which I discovered but I remembered while writing, uh, while preparing for this session, one I dedicated to Jonathan and all that you've done. It's a short history of, it's called the Third War or a short history of the post-Cold War age and it's dedicated to human security. And because it's rather somber and a wake up call, I wanted to end our session, which I thought would be much after I shared the first poem with a very jolly poem I wrote during COVID dedicated to Mother Earth. But if I could present the second poem since already our speaker for the last session is with us, Gabriella, if I could present the second poem as a handover to you, Gary, for your glorious last session, would that be okay Gary if I do it that way so we don't eat into wonderful so the first is the third world war um, the great divide was pulled down stone by stone young women and men ran across the rubble to hug their unknown brothers soldiers turned down their guns and refused to follow orders a new era had begun. Everywhere borders crumbled, ceasefires were signed, and gunshots were drowned by songs of celebration. From the smoke of dying wars, a new slogan rose. Human security before state security. People matter more than territory. A soft Euphoria reigned in the international community. New alliances formed between states and civil society to reshape a new era of ecological and human prosperity. Till that fatal day that frayed it brutally on 9-11, First, a string of solidarity circled the globe and linked us in fraternal mourning. But it was not to last. Terror and the war on terror were unleashed together in their incalculable consequences. We were divided again into us versus them. Now the veil of order has been ripped apart again. The vanquished one has raised his fist in brazen defiance. Wielding the might of giants, he threatens the foundations of the world we know. We reel in uncertainty and indignation, matching threat with threat, daily escalating the stakes, yet unable to act as we must. 
with courage and conscience. Now, a last chance has come our way. COVID has shaken us to our senses. Floyd has ripped apart old defenses. May the winds of awakening rouse us from our final stupor and save us in time. Oh dear. It takes a poem to conclude the, a poet to conclude this session. I will speak no more, Jonathan. Very, very simply, uh, Anbu, Anbu, Anbu. That is a wonderful Tamil word for love. And uh, so, I began with an adage: Love people, use things. Never love things and use people. The world spent over $560 billion in advertising last year to persuade people to get things, mostly things that are not needed. The wise since time immemorial have told us to have hearts without borders and to see the human family as one. What we're discovering now is there's a convergence of wisdom and practical necessity. So in our next conversation with this group, I think we should come together and discuss the practical steps to bring our borderless hearts into necessary action to realize the vision that it hasn't been born yet that is calling us. Uh, and I, and in all humility, I really say thank you. And I thank that mystery that puts compassion and love in our hearts. It's beyond name or form, but I know in this group, I can say, it is present, it is alive, and it is real. Thank you so much and thank that mystery. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you for participating in this session. It has been a, the most joyful trip ever. Thank you.